Thank you all for tuning in. It's a pleasure to be here with you virtually. Um, as Jim just mentioned, I work at Northern Arizona University, but I also wanna highlight that much of the work that I do is a collaborative effort that involves numerous different institutions. And just a few of the logos from some of them are shown here. Um, I'm gonna be taking questions at the end of the talk, but if you come up with something and um, don't wanna forget it, feel free to type it in the chat at any time and we can come back to it at the end. Um, so I wanna start off today by um, giving you a bit of an overview of how the next 45 minutes or so are gonna go. Um, the first part of the talk, Why Mars, is gonna cover kind of what motivates us to study the planet Mars. Um, in, and the way I like to phrase this, what about Mars teaches us about Earth? The second part of my talk, I'm gonna give you a short history of how we've studied Mars and the infrared wavelengths of light. And then the last part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about some field analog research that myself and uh, my collaborators have been doing. Um, and this part of the talk really is about what we learn about Mars from studying Earth. So enthusiasm for Mars has been around uh, essentially for the last couple hundred years or so since we first discovered that it was a world of interest in our neighbor. And um, it was particularly popularized in the 90s by the famous planetary scientist, Carl Sagan. Um, and I just wanna read you one of, one of his quotes from the 90s about some of our motivation for heading to Mars. Maybe we're on Mars because of the magnificent science that can be done there. The gates of the wonder world are opening in our time. Maybe we're on Mars because we have to be, because there's a deep nomadic impulse built into us by the evolutionary process. We come after all from hunter gatherers and for 99% of our tenure on earth, we've been wanderers. And the next place to wander to is Mars. And so studying Mars isn't just a thing of the 90s. I, it's still a lot of enthusiasm for sending spacecraft and potentially people to the red planet. Um, this is a cover from, or a cover of popular science that came out just a couple months ago with a quote from John, the author, John Noble Wilford. Mars tugs at the human imagination like no other planet. And I think perhaps this sentiment is maybe why some of you are here listening to this talk today, but um, I think we can get a bit more specific about why Mars captures the human imagination. There are things after all that make it interesting to us. It's not just a plain old rock floating in space. So what makes Mars unique? Well, it has an atmosphere and it's perhaps the most Earth-like atmosphere we've observed on another world in our solar system. Although it's much thinner, it's less than 1% of Earth's surface pressure, and it's made up of 95% carbon dioxide, unlike our nitrogen-rich atmosphere. Mars also has two small moons, and you might know that the name Mars is, comes from the Roman god of war. Well, Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Phobos is that little white dot streaking across your screen right now. Um, those are named after sons of Ares, who's the Greek god of war, essentially the Greek version of Mars. And one thing that I think is fun is if you were standing on Mars's surface and were wondering what the moons would look like here, or what a solar eclipse from Phobos on the top and Deimos on the bottom would look like. It's technically not an eclipse because it's not covering the entire sun. It's technically a transit, but, um, but these are actual data taken from the Curiosity rover as it observed events. And so if we take a closer look at Mars's surface, we can see some amazing geologic features that uh, inspire us to wonder about what else is on the planet and what's on our own planet. There's volcanoes like Olympus Mons that are the size of Arizona. There's 
giant canyon, Valles Marineris, that would stretch across the entirety of the United States. And pretty much everywhere we look on the surface, in nearly every image, there are these channel networks, which even if you're not a geologist, you can recognize as being formed by the presence of water flowing across the surface. And so we can look to features like these on the surface for geologic tracers of the past, understanding what happened in the past of, of Mars. So if we look at a geologic timeline, and this is a geologic timeline of Earth dating back in billions of years to about four and a half billion years ago with zero being present day, <clears throat> we can pick out some seminal moments in the geologic history of Earth that have been pretty defining in shaping both the evolution of life and the evolution of our planet. Obviously, there's the formation of our planet, but there's also the moon forming impact that occurred about 4.3 billion years ago. There's the oldest rock samples that we have come from this era, the Jack Hill Zircons. Um, the first evidence for any sort of tracers of life come from around 4 billion years ago. But the thing about all of this really important scientific information that makes up a very, very tiny percent, less than 1% of Earth's rock record. And this, this is the material that we have access to on the surface of the Earth. And the reason for that is that the Earth is a very energetic planet and there's lots of erosion and tectonic processes that essentially are very good at erasing tracers of the past. Now, if we were to overprint that same geologic timeline, except now from Mars, um, with the thought that early Mars was a lot like early Earth in many ways, this period on Mars called the Noachian Hesperian and Hesperian eras makes up about 50% of Mars's rock record. And this is because modern day Mars has much less erosion and much less erasing than modern Earth does. And the reason that I'm pointing this out is because in this way, Mars provides us with a window or an opportunity to assess the early climate history of terrestrial planets like Earth and the early solar system in a way that Earth itself doesn't really afford us the opportunity to do. And so this begs the question, what climates and what geologic histories are recorded in Martian rocks? Well, this is actually a somewhat debated topic in the Mars community. There's one faction that believes that Mars at one point was warm and wet, much like Earth is today, that it hosted oceans and rivers and lakes. And if it did host these things, it likely hosted life as well. But it's also possible that Mars has always been a cold and dry and desolate world like it is today. And that these events that formed the channel features that I showed you were only very short lived and didn't really stick around very long. Either way, one thing the community agrees on is that we're interested in figuring out why Mars didn't become a lush and verdant world like Earth is. How did it become the cold and dry world that it is today and not this artist's depiction? So I wanna talk about kind of three fundamental reasons that we choose to study Mars. Um, just to recap, the first would be to use Mars and their solar system objects like it to understand ourselves and our own planet. Second is because it gives us an opportunity to search for the origins of life, the origins of our solar system, and perhaps the origins of the universe in a way that we can't really do on Earth. And I wanna add in a third point, and that's by promoting a culture where we uh, are exploring places like Mars, we're inspiring future generations, and we're creating a thriving culture of innovation and imagination that values science and technology, something that I think our society desperately needs right now. So let's 
let's transition to talking about infrared light. That's kind of going to be the focal point for much of the rest of the talk. Um, so all of the images I've shown you so far of Mars's surface were taken in the visible wavelengths of light, but there are many more colors than we can see with our eyes. And much of what, what I'm interested in, uh, in studying on Mars, is stuff that we can make out in the infrared. And you can think of infrared light as a color range that's on the other side of red from orange. So it's just beyond what we can make out with our eyes. And there's a couple different values to studying objects in the infrared. Um, one is our ability to observe properties that distinguish different material types that we wouldn't otherwise be able to pick out. For example, here's a sequence of calibration images taken by the cameras on the Perseverance rover, Mars's or NASA's newest rover. Um, and there's a visible image as we'd see with our eyes on the left. And then there's a false color infrared image on our right. And if we, um, if we didn't have the information on the right, we wouldn't necessarily be able to pick out these strong uh, atomic signatures that we see in this red banding of this rock in the center. We wouldn't be able to see this transition from blue to green and this rock on top as easily. And the importance of this is that we can use these diagnostic signatures to tell us what rocks are made out of and, and by extension, what environments formed those rocks. We can also use infrared light to track temperatures of sediments and rocks. And so many of you might be familiar with infrared light as a tool for scanning people's body temperatures, especially in the time of COVID. Um, we can use that same theory to kind of study splotches on the surface. This is an image taken from the Curiosity rover of a basaltic dune in Gale Crater. And we can, if we observe it long enough, we can observe the temperature throughout the course of the day. So this is a, a plot showing a day on Mars going from midnight to midnight. And you can see the temperature rises at sunrise, peaks around midday, and then drops steeply around sunset. And this is a typical temperature curve that helps us infer properties of materials. And so the next question is, how do we use technology to see infrared? Um, well, there's a couple different tools. Um, the first is through filters, and that's how the rovers uh, observe infrared light with, with their eyes. This is a schematic of the Curiosity rover's mass cam. And you can think of using filters as um, something akin to using tinted ski goggles, if any of you remember those orange ski goggles that used to be popular. Um, it basically subtracts any light that is not in the wavelength that you're interested in. But a bit more sophisticated tool, and this is the tool that is popular on most orbiting spacecraft at Mars, such as the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and its PRISM instrument, is to use a sequence of slits and gratings to essentially diffract the light. And you can think of this like sticking a prism up to the light and then recording the brightness of each color one step at a time. I wanna take a step back and kind of talk about what we're capable of from Earth. Uh, here's a series of visible images taken from Lowell Observatory, which is about a hundred year old observatory located in Flagstaff, Arizona, where I'm currently speaking to you from. And if you look at these somewhat blurry old images of Mars, you can still pick out some interesting features. You can see Mars's Southern polar ice caps. You can see some bright and dark spots, which appear in all the different four sides of Mars. But if we add in infrared light, this is a infrared image taken from the Gemini South Observatory in Chile, you can pick out some additional features, some deep dark spots in Mars's South that indicate that it's much colder there when that image was taken. A dark spot on the equator, and some bright spots to the left side of the image here, indicating some 
difference in material properties between these bright and dark spots. But there's a challenge to observing planets like Mars in the infrared from telescopes on Earth, and that is atmospheric gases like CO2 and, and water. And um, the reason it's challenging is because these gases like to block infrared light. This is the same process that controls the greenhouse gas effect or global warming, that these gases retain heat and prevent us from seeing through it in these wavelengths. So we can, the next logical step, send telescopes to space. These are images of Mars from Hubble Space Telescope. And we can already, just by sending something into Earth orbit, pick out some much more finely detailed features on the surface. You can see the glare of Mars's atmosphere. You can pick out these differences in the dark regions of Mars. This dark region is very bright in the infrared, while this one isn't indicating difference in material properties. And we expect to get even better data from the new James Webb Space Telescope, which has just entered Earth orbit a few months ago. But we're still limited by distance in the resolution we can get of Mars's surface. And so that's why we send spacecraft to Mars. So this is just an example from Perseverance rover's flight trajectory with all the different trajectory correction maneuvers or different propulsion episodes listed. Um, and just to give you an idea, this flight path from Earth eventually to Mars took Perseverance rover six and a half months, so it's quite an ordeal. But once we get to Mars, um, we begin collecting data. So um, I want to spend the next few slides kind of covering the history of the different spacecraft that we've sent to Mars that have been able to observe in the infrared. The first couple were the Mariner 6 and 7 probes, which had infrared spectrometers and radiometers. And this was back in the era before computer imaging when the data was literally printed out and then scientists had to tape it together to make any sort of interpretations of the mosaics that came out. And ultimately, the data that came from those probes produced maps like this, where really the only data that's coming from those probes is these higher resolution spots. The rest is filled in by data from telescopes. And the reason for that is that these, these probes just achieved flybys. They didn't actually orbit Mars. We didn't quite know how to get into orbit yet. And we wanted to first test out whether we could just get close enough to take pictures. But it turns out during those flybys, which only captured data over these small areas of the surface, pretty much missed all the cool stuff like the volcanoes and canyons I showed you. So a few years later, we sent the Mariner 9 probe. And this was the first spacecraft to actually achieve orbit around Mars. And, um, and it was able to capture, again, infrared data, but still pretty low resolution, as you'll see in a few slides, by modern standards. Really, the only infrared data are these little lines that tell us how bright that patch within the shape is. Um, I've actually seen this data, which was, also, again, written out on paper and mosaic together hand by hand at the birthday party for Hugh Kiefer, who was one of the chief scientists on these instruments at the time. So if we move forward a few years, we get to the Viking orbiter, which gives much more detailed maps. This is still surface temperature data, but it's plotted in the form of what you can think of like topographic data on a map where different lines represent different temperatures. You can see a negative 10 here. You can see negative 20 in Celsius up here. Um, and so we're beginning to get a higher resolution picture of the surface in the 70s. I'll also point out that this mission was also the first time we got a photograph of Mars's surface. This is a photograph from the Viking 1 lander. But we progressed even further in the coming decades in the 90s. Mars Global Surveyor carried an instrument called the Thermal Emission Spectrometer, or TESS, and it really began to give us a global picture of Mars's surface temperatures throughout time. And so 
what we are seeing with this instrument is that Mars is a pretty cold place. It averages a very frigid negative 63 on its surface, but at certain times of year and certain places on the surface, it can actually reach up to 20 degrees Celsius, which for those of you not familiar with Celsius is pretty much room temperature. And so some parts of Mars are actually quite Earth-like while other parts remain quite alien and frigid. Ultimately, the newest infrared instrument that we've sent in orbit around Mars was aboard the 2001 Mars Odyssey probe. And it was the Thermal Emission Imaging System, or THEMIS. And this has provided us with unprecedented high resolution images of Mars's surface through time. And you can pick out that there are some dramatic differences. This is infrared image in the daytime, the infrared image in the nighttime. And you can see there are some things like this ejecta around these craters that are very bright in the middle of the day and very dark at night, while this region in between the two craters is very dark during the day, very bright at night. And the unique thing about observing data like this is that we can actually tell what materials are based or are made out of based on these temperature signatures through time. And so Themis has done a really good job of capturing repeated images over the same spot, over the same, um, over, over the same orbits, um, time and time again, day after day, season after season, giving us um, a really detailed time picture of what temperatures are like at different points on the surface. Now, there's a property of materials essentially is what dictates its temperature through time. This is a property called thermal inertia. And the gist is that different types of rocks change temperature at different rates. And this is, again, another plot of surface temperature through time. And essentially what I want you to see here is this green line is a fine material. You can think of this like dust or sand. Gets really hot in the middle of the day and really cold at night, while this pink line, which is you can think of as a bedrock or a solid slab of material, is getting not quite as hot during the middle of the day and not quite as cold at night. And so if I were to kind of give you an intuition, low thermal inertia material is like sand on a beach. It warms up quickly during the day. And, and many of you have probably had the experience of walking on hot sand in the summer. But it also cools down quickly at night. And so if you're walking on, around moonrise on the beach, you act, it's actually quite cool. Whereas a high thermal inertia material warms up slowly. Maybe you've sat on a rock bench on a hot summer's day and felt that it was still cool, but it also cools down slowly. Maybe you've sat on that same bench or touched a rock after the sunset. And even though the air is chilly, the rock is still warm from having been exposed to the sun. And so we can use this property to study rock record on Mars. And one region I was interested in was this large region of Mars called Arabia Terra, which hosted these mounds of layered material that covered a vast area of Mars's surface um, within these craters. And Here's another image just illustrating how magnificently beautiful I think these materials are. And kind of the one, the thing that is intriguing about having layered feature zebra patterns like this, is that each individual layer is a record of the climate change, a record of some changing event that caused an interruption in the deposition of that material. And that's special because it allows us to figure out what was happening that changed Mars's environment, potentially to either preclude or include potential life at one point. So we look at craters, this is a bit zoomed out, you can't quite see the layers anymore, but I assure you they're there within this crater, which I'm showing in 3D view. This is a visible black and white image. Now, if we overlay the infrared image 
over that, we can begin to pick out some bright spots, dark spots. And what we learn from studying the infrared imagery of this site is that many of these layers are pretty soft. They're soft, maybe like a cookie, like a chocolate chip cookie. Now we can add in another set of infrared images, this time not looking at temperature as much as composition. We can pick out some prominent minerals, olivine, clays, sulfates. What these basically tell us is that there was water present at some point. It doesn't tell us in what form, but it tells us that there was water. And so if you patch <clears throat> this evidence together, essentially what we're left with is two theories for how these deposits, which extend across much of Mars' surface could have formed, either through a combination of atmospheric dust intermixing with snow, just like ice is deposited in Greenland and in other glaciers on Earth's surface, or through a combination of groundwater kind of seeping up into these craters and either dust or volcanic ash eventually falling into the water and forming layers in the water. Regardless, what this indicates is that there is the potential for life having been there at one point if there was water stably there in one way or another. But we can't really answer whether it was one or the other of these scenarios without really taking a finer look. And so Mars's rovers and landers really serve as our ground truth. And the ground by ground truth, I mean, it really tells us what is going on on the ground in an image where we have a much rougher picture from orbit. And so that's what Mars's Perseverance rover is doing. It's drilled into this rock to tell us what its composition and other mineral properties are, um, which we can only half guess at with images from orbit. And so this allows us to confirm that what we're seeing from orbit is real. We also have a, a, a fleet of past rovers that have explored other areas of, on Mars. This includes exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, the Mars Science Laboratory or Curiosity rover, and also a series of landers, including the InSight lander, which doesn't rove around per se, but sits in one spot and still collects high quality data. And just to give you an idea of what these rovers can do, this is showing you the landing site in Jezero Crater for the Perseverance rover. Um, let me just, as an aside, say this site is super interesting because it has this big delta feature indicating that there was very active water at one point in the region flowing in from this channel into the crater. But what, and then this is the rover landing spot, what this rover can do is it can look out and it can use its filter wheel, as I showed you in that slide earlier, to observe this rock outcrop here in the visible and here in the infrared and confirm at close whether the infrared signatures we were seeing from orbit also appear in these rocks or whether they appear in the dirt beneath the rock outcrop or actually in the cliffs themselves. And so we get, begin to get this really detailed picture of this, of this small spot on Mars from these rovers. But rovers are only able to give us insight into very tiny regions of the surface. And Mars is, or at least once was, a dynamic place where there's lots of different rocks and lots of different environments that once existed. And so we're not really getting the whole picture from these rovers. Now, one tool we can use to assess these different environments on Mars's surface is to go to different sites on, on Earth, or what we call Earth analogs, that we think are similar to these sites on Mars that we haven't yet visited with the rovers. And so this is a map of all the different analog sites that we've either visited or are planning on visiting in the near future. And we pick these suite of sites through a series of criteria. They're salt derived, that's the dominant surface material on Mars. There's a diverse sampling of different surface environments. There's minimal vegetation because there isn't vegetation on Mars. And 
feasible access. I'm gonna get into each one of these stars in a bit, but I wanna tell you quickly about what we do at each site. So at each site, we set up a weather station and it carries with it this thermal infrared camera. And that camera sits on the end of one of these arms and points straight down at the surface and captures continuous minute by minute surface data um, of the temperature of individual spots. And um, when we pair this with other instruments, such as radiometer, this the energy from the sun onto the surface, a thermometer gives us the air temperature, wind speed we get from an anemometer, that's this little windmill looking thing, soil moisture, all these things basically tell us what the energy is that's controlling the temperature and allows us to interpret what different temperature signals tell us about different rock types. And so the first example I'm gonna give you is about our objective to interpret sand dune formation and composition. Here's an image of the Curiosity rover, a selfie per se, from Gale Crater of the Bagnell Dune. And here is myself and my advisor, Christopher Edwards, at our basaltic dune site in Northern Arizona. Here's our tower of weather station instruments and our drone that's taking infrared imagery. And just to view you into where this is, if you're familiar with Arizona, um, our field site is in this northern part of Arizona, um, just about a 45 minute drive away from Flagstaff, where I am now. To give you some insight into some more analogies, we know that there's wind on Mars and it causes dust devils, just like many of you have, may have seen on Earth if you've been to dry regions. This is a dust devil observed by Curiosity and Gale Crater. And here, the dust devil may be a bit harder to see, observed by a human with an iPhone at our sunset dune site. And you can kind of see the faint outline of it as it moves across the scene here. And it's picking up sediment and throwing it around along the way. And you know what we know is that processes like this are the dominant process for moving sediment in a way that forms sand dunes like this. And so we're able to then use our drone imagery. Here's a visible image of that same site I was just showing you in the video, but this time looking straight down from above. And here's an infrared image. And as you can immediately see, you can pick out some really interesting patterns in the surface temperature that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see without the infrared data. So these really bright yellow spots are hotter, 20 degrees Celsius, and the darker purple spots are colder. And so we're figuring out what about these different stripes is controlling how the temperature manifests itself in this imagery. Is it something to do with grain size? Is it something to do with ripples? Um, this is all stuff that helps us interpret the surface of Mars. We're also identifying hydrothermal deposits. This is a figure of Martian deposits on the left that show these what are called digitate structures or kind of like coral reef type structures. And we can compare them to similar deposits on Earth, these similar hydrothermal or hot spring deposits. And the special thing about having discovered these on Mars is that wherever there are hot springs on Earth, there is all, essentially always life. And so if there were hot springs that left these deposits on Mars at one point, there's a pretty good chance that microbes could have existed in those environments. So we went to a hot spring in southern Utah called Roosevelt Hot Spring. And here is me standing with the hot spring at my back with uh, steam rising up from the vents. This is also a nostalgic image for me because this is the last known photograph of me wearing these pants, which happened to be my favorite pair of pants at the time, which were a casualty of disintegration by sulfuric acid from these hot springs during this campaign. And here's the drone imagery of that site, the visible imagery, and you can see this area where all the vegetation has been, has been um, 
burned away by the hot spring. And you can see in that same area, super hot temperatures, 136 degrees Fahrenheit emanating from these hot spring channels. And so we can also look for heat signatures of hot springs on Mars in a similar way. Another thing we're interested in is interpreting volcanic materials on Mars's surface. There's a large deposit of material covering this region next to some of Mars's largest volcanoes called the Medusa Fosse Formation. And it's highly debated whether this material is a lava flow or whether it's volcanic ash to very different materials. The importance of the distinction being that volcanic ash requires a lot more water or other gases to have formed than lava does. And if there was water, again, there was a higher chance of there having once been life. You can see a kind of a 3D view of one wing of those deposits as it empties out over a crater here. So an analog for that site that we picked out was Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii. It's at the southeastern part of the big island of Hawaii. And we picked a field site right on the edge of one of the side craters called Keanakakoi. And I picked a site right at the edge of this lava flow that spills into the crater there and right at the edge of this big ash deposit next to the lava flow. I'll point out we also have satellite thermal imagery of that site. And if we explode that up a little bit bigger, use the visible image blown up, you can see that the warmest or brightest spots are all where there's not any vegetation, where the darkest lava flows are. This is a bit more zoomed out than the data that we collected, but it gives you a picture of the types of environments and the types of temperature responses we're looking at. One thing that's really interesting about this part of Hawaii is you can go basically five miles from the east side of Kilauea Summit in a rainforest environment like this to a desolate, very Martian environment in what's called the Ka'u Desert to the southwest of the summit in basically less than a five minute drive. And so this site lets us again build this weather station setup powered by solar panels, take a close look at the surface ash, ash deposits. And then here's a visible image taken from the camera on the edge of this weather station. And here's an infrared image of that site. And we can distinguish these different rocky materials from each other using this infrared data and figure out what they're made out of. Another suite of sites that we went to is in the Mojave Desert near Las Vegas. Um, we picked two sites, the Perump Playa area and Sperry Wash. The first of which is an analog to dry lake beds on Mars. So many of you may know that one of the reasons we've sent the Curiosity rover to Gale Crater is because there's strong evidence that this crater was once an active lake and today is a dry lake bed. And if we compare the Parham Playa site that we went to in the Mojave Desert to Gale Crater, we see a lot of similarities. Um, the Curiosity rover landed here at the Bradbury Landing and then extended its traverse off the left of this image, but we can see that the edge of Gale Crater rises up above this lake deposit, just as these mountains in the Mojave Desert rise above the playa. And I can show you a little video to give you a little more of a cinematic insight into what this field site looks like. You can see the expansive playa lake bed. You can see the rim of this mountains, and then there's kind of this slow slope that descends off the mountains into the lake, similar to the way it does in Gale Crater. And so again, here's images the visible from our drone, and you can't make out much of a difference except for the fact that there's this speckle of plants on the left where this slope is, and there's no plants and just whiteness on the right in the dry lake bed. But when we look at it in the infrared, we see that the slope is much hotter in the middle of the day, 3.30 p.m. And this dry lake bed is much colder, indicating a much higher thermal inertia here. Another feature we're interested in is tracking active flows. And so on Mars, 
there's evidence of these features called recurring slope lineae. There's these dark flow patterns that form seasonally on the surface. This is a mosaic of images taken over a couple different seasons on Mars. And there's a hot debate again over whether these features hosted or host water or whether they're purely the result of dry processes of rocks just cascading down slope without any water. So we want to image this. We went to, again, a site called Sperry Wash, and we captured a time series of images of an active channel that was filling up as we were there. And we see this uh, flow feature forming as we're observing it over the course of three days. And if we observe it in the, in the infrared, we can pick out this pattern as well. And we can also pick out some interesting patterns in the sediments and rocks around with these, this dark patch appearing at one part of the day, light patches at the other parts of the day. These shadows along the edge of the cliff are just from the sun. So the last thing I wanna point out is that Mars also hosts tracers of past and present water ice at or beneath its surface. And you can see this big deposit here looks very similar to glaciers on Earth. Now, it's not clear whether there's actually ice within this deposit, but there may have been at one time. We do know, however, that across Mars's surface, each of these blue dots represents points where there's likely to be a thick layer of ice, at least in the shallow subsurface. And so the next place we're heading to this May is a glacier analog site in Iceland, where we're gonna analyze the sediments right at the margin of Vatna Jokul Glacier in Southern Iceland. So I don't have data yet to show you there, but this is satellite infrared imagery of that region. So just to summarize what I've talked about so far, in the first part of the talk, I noted that Mars inspires us and it records our past. Infrared imaging is a rapidly evolving and diversely applicable tool in planetary science. And by studying Mars-like features on Earth, we're going to be able to make better sense of our neighbor. And so with that, I wanna thank you for listening. I also wanna leave you with this acknowledgement slide of all the folks who have been part of this research. It's, as I said, been a collaborative effort with a large team. And so at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed learning about our work. All right, thanks so much. Uh, so we did have a question. Uh, what types of software, AI, or machine learning do you use to manage all the data you've collected? Yeah, so um, machine learning is an essential part of planetary science in this era. Um, and that is, I can bounce around some slides here, actually. Um, that is because the data that's coming back is perhaps too complex for our brains to understand on their own. And so we use um, data algorithms to help us interpret data. So all of this data I kind of gave to you in a simplistic form. And I said, we make interpretations based on each data set, but really what we are doing is using clustering algorithms. These are um, algorithms that identify unique suites of properties in all the different data sets and tell us um, it, they basically differentiate different surfaces from one another. And so, for example, a clustering algorithm might pick out that this green region is one type of surface, this red region is a different type of surface, and this blue region up here is a different type of surface. And by doing that, it differentiates these materials in a way that allows us to make geologic interpretations of the past environment. So, one tool we're using clustering algorithms. We're also using, when I'm taking data with the weather station, I'm putting all of this together to make a predictive model for what these materials are made out of based on the temperatures we observe and all of the different data sets we take in. And so with that, if you're familiar, we use Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations. So how certain are we that the geologic processes that are operating on Mars, like depositing of new rock and eroding of old rocks, 
is that how similar is that to processes on earth yeah so it's a that's a good question um so there are some similarities but there are also some dramatic differences one thing that martian scientists always have to tell ourselves is that even though mars looks quite similar to desert environments on earth it's still an alien world it's still not um it's still not earth and the big distinction in, tor in terms of erosion and deposition, as I mentioned, Mars's atmosphere is much, much thinner, less than, a, less than 1% the pressure of Earth's atmosphere. And that means that wind is a lot less intense. Wind, as it happens, is pretty much the dominant erosional and depositional process on Mars today. It may not have always been, but today, um, because there isn't any active water anymore, because asteroid bombardment isn't as intense as it once was. It's basically wind that is shaping the modern surface. But wind is, is a lot less intense because of this thin atmosphere. And so it's actually been kind of an enigma in the Mars community, figuring out how we can make similar sand dune features like these. And us devils like these with such a thin atmosphere, all the models show that we shouldn't be able to form dust devils like these. I say all the models, that was up until the last five years or so, um, where the state of the art basically is that there are very complex convective processes in the Martian atmosphere that lead to these very nuanced and very isolated eddy currents that are driven by fluid dynamical processes. And these lead to the channelization of air currents into high pressure systems that hit the surface at very isolated locations. And so while the majority of Mars at any given point may not be as intensely erosive or depositional as the majority of Earth is, little pieces bit by bit are eroding the surface. And if you take that over the course of 3 billion years, which is essentially the most recent geologic period in Mars's history, bit by bit, it whittles away at the surface and moves sediment around. We also know that, like, like I showed from Ezero Crater, um, ancient, ancient fluvial systems or systems that are driven by streams and rivers deposited sediments within basins like this. And so while this process isn't occurring on Mars anymore, this was, when it was occurring, a very Earth-like process at the time. Okay, great. Uh, so if we are actually observing water on the surface of Mars in some of these images, I mean, what would that be like? So one example, one example of actually observing water would be in these flow features. And so there, there aren't a lot of possible scenarios that would lead to water being stable on Mars's surface. Because its atmosphere is so thin, water essentially evaporates away within, within seconds or minutes of being deposited on the surface. And so the only way for there to be water in these streaks is if it was contained in the subsurface in ice or bound up in minerals in some way and not actually exposed directly to the sun. Now, the theory for there being water in these recurring slope lineae is that some trigger allows for the release of that water down the slope. And that trigger could be that the slope gets hot enough that some little crust melts away and then the water kind of melts out of it and shows up as these dark streaks before it evaporates away. Another explanation is that um, similarly, there are just minerals that have water bound to them. Um, and those minerals uh, accumulate enough water in the right temperature conditions to, to drop loose from the, from the slope wall and fall down the slope. You know, there are other explanations that don't involve water, um, where just purely rock without water is falling down the slope 
And it happens to be that the rock in the slope up here is darker than the stuff down here, creating a dark streak. But yes, if there was active water on the surface today, um, this is the most likely place we think we'd see it. And as you can see, pretty quickly after it's deposited, it fades away. All right, great. So if we could slide over to some mineralogy real quick. Um, how accurately do you think that uh, the mineral identification is happening from the infrared? Yeah, so, so a large part of what the rovers are doing is analyzing infrared data. Rovers have a bunch of different tools on board, including X-ray diffraction, infrared imagers. There's also uh, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. That's, those are different things that they don't actually involve infrared light per se. This image that I'm showing you here is, um, is giving us a, pit, a window into the infrared signatures. And you can see that in this space, the background stuff is green. Some of the sand in the foreground is blue. Some of the, the bedrock is all red. This is basically just showing us that there are chemical differences in these rock outcrops. While that might not be as detailed a picture as X-ray diffraction or laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy would give us, those are things where you get up close and drill at it or scoop up a sample. Um, what they do allow us to do is directly relate to the infrared data that we're collecting from satellites. And that is perhaps our best tool in measuring mineralogy from orbit. And so this actually is a false color infrared image of Jezero Crater laid over visible imagery to be able to ease, more easily pick out features. And each of the different colors in this image, the green, the yellow, the blue, is picking out, the red down here, is picking out different mineral signatures. We think that these are carbonates up here. And one exciting thing about carbonates is on Earth, carbonates form um, where there's life. Um, carbonates are essentially what coral is made out of. Um, and then this red area down here is olivine. That's essentially lava flow. And so we're seeing some dramatic differences in the compositions of materials from orbit here. And we're able to use the infrared imagery from the rover to tell us at a fine scale what we're looking at. All right, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring it to a close for today. Uh, thank you to Mr. Ari Kopel for being with us today. Uh, great presentation. Uh, so thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. Uh, please join us on Wednesday, March 16th at noon. Uh, for 10 millions of zombie wasps help control the invasive emerald ash borer. Uh, so this is about methods of biocontrol for controlling uh, the invasive species, the emerald ash borer. And that's presented by Dr. Christine Grayson. She's Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Richmond. You can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend. It is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you all for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Mm -hmm.